Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Scott Worden, and I am the director of the Afghanistan program for the U.S. Institute of Peace. I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists for taking time out of their busy schedule to be with us today, as well as the World Bank for its support and cooperation in organizing this timely event on Afghanistan's economy. We're thrilled to have so many joining us virtually as well as in person, and you can engage with this event and with each other through Twitter throughout the event using today's hashtag, hashtag USIP Afghanistan, all one word. We also invite all of you to take part in today's discussion by asking a question using the chat box function on the uh, event page. We hope that you include your name and specify where you are joining us from, and we'll select questions from the chat put them on cards and give to the moderator uh, throughout the discussion. For those in person, my colleagues will be distributing note cards and please write your questions on those cards uh, to become involved. As many of you know, USIP was founded 35 years ago by the US Congress as an independent, nonpartisan national institute tasked with preventing, mitigating, and resolving violent conflict. As you can see in Afghanistan, <laughs> we still have more work to do. USIP is actively engaged on Afghanistan programs since 2002, and we continue to engage with Afghans both abroad and in the country to try to mitigate the dire humanitarian, economic, and human rights conditions that are going on now. As we see from the headlines coming from Afghanistan, there is a distinct humanitarian crisis, but this is underpinned by an economic crisis and even driven by the economic crisis. Uh, this is caused by the lack of development aid, it's caused by the freezing of central bank assets, it's caused by a cash crunch uh, as a result of a, a stalling of the banking system, and other factors. Uh, to address the crisis, however, I think the dimensions of it need to be more clear, and this is the purpose of today's discussion. We'll lead off by two new reports by the World Bank. The first is a private sector rapid survey, which was released on April 7th, and this assesses the impact of the August 2021 political crisis and the takeover of Afghanistan on private firms and jobs in Afghanistan. The second report is the first Afghanistan development update, which has been released since the Taliban took over, and that is being released today. So we will hear the findings from these two reports and then have a discussion with our distinguished panel about the implications and where to go from here. Our moderator today is Bill Byrd in the center. He is the senior expert on Afghanistan with USIP. He has spent decades working on Afghanistan, including serving as the World Bank's country manager from 2002 to 2006, and then serving as an economic advisor on Afghanistan before joining USIP. Thanks everybody for joining us, and I will turn it over to Bill to introduce the panelists and lead the discussion. Thank you, Scott, for the uh, introduction. Uh, I'm really happy and actually thrilled to be moderating today.
that's not working. Um, are, are any of them working? Hello? Yeah, that one. Just this one. I'm, I'm just, I, it's voice activated, I think, Bill. Yeah, I think, I think I'd better not repeat all the introductions, but happy to. <laughs> so Andrea Dalolio is the lead country economist for Afghanistan, currently focusing on private sector and financial sector issues. He worked with IFC on the enabling environment in Tajikistan for business, then in Kazakhstan coordinating bank, private sector, and financial sector development operations in Central Asia. In between 2012 and 2016, he was based in Tanzania, working on Tanzania, Uganda, and Burundi, and more recently in the Europe and Central Asia Department. And previously, before joining the bank, he was a management consultant at McKinsey & Company. Jeffrey Grieco probably needs no introduction at all for this group, but I'll <laughs> let's. Uh, I will uh, just pick out a few highlights. I think, but he's president and CEO of the Afghan Afghan American Chamber of Commerce, where he served on AACC's board since 2011. He's proactively advocated for the needs of Afghan businesses and NGOs, as well as in recent months assisting with the evacuation and resettlement of Afghan refugees and promoting humanitarian support to the Afghan people. He manages a number of, Af of Afghanistan working groups, uh, and he also serves as an independent foreign policy and business consultant. Amid a long and distinguished career, he served as assistant administrator for legislative and public affairs at USAID, and has represented multinational corporations in their investments in global markets. So now we really get into the substance, and uh, this is these are exciting reports, and I think we should uh, focus not so much on all the detail and recent developments, but much more on the current situation and what needs to be done moving forward. So in that light, I'll be asking an opening question to each panelist in turn. So, for, so Tobias, uh, this is the World Bank's first development update since the Taliban takeover. And uh, I don't think we need to go back to the economic implosion we've seen over the past eight months, but the report provides excellent background on that, and I encourage everybody to read it uh, for that background uh, to, to look at what's been happening economically in the last eight months. But, but turning to the present situation, what are your four to five key takeaways uh, that you would like to emphasize uh, in terms of what's happening now? And then what are the three to four key recommendations of the report that need to be taken forward? Thank you so much, Bill. Um, so main takeaways uh, regarding the current situation. You know, I think the biggest takeaway probably from the report is the severity of the current situation. Uh, we are seeing now an economy that was dependent upon grants for 45% of GDP, 75% of public spending, uh, half of the government budget. Uh, and, and a large proportion of those grants have ceased. Uh, at the same time as there has been a, a major macroeconomic adjustment being caused by uh, the loss of hard currency inflows and the loss of access to foreign exchange reserves, uh, on top of which there is a, a major financial sector crisis which has been triggered by the breakdown of international banking relationships. So three crises stacked one on top of the other. Uh, and we're seeing an estimated one-third reduction in incomes uh, in an economy that was already one of the poorest in the world, uh, where the poverty rate was 47%, and where we estimate another 45% of the population was at risk of falling into poverty. Uh, and we have estimated that per capita incomes now have fallen back to around 2007 levels. So we've lost 15 years of development progress. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's hard to overstate the extent and depth of the current crisis. So that, that would be my, my first takeaway. My second takeaway would be it's hard to see on the current trajectory how this is going to improve. 
Uh, if, if things remain as they are, yes, I think there's going to be some adjustment. The private sector will find ways of doing things. But, but broadly speaking, on the current trajectory, when you have a population growth rate of 2.5% of and, and the economy is growing at maybe 3% over the next 10 years, we're, we're not going to be making any progress. Uh, so, so that really means that living standards are not going to be improving. Uh, and because of that, you're going to see continued dependence upon humanitarian support. You're going to see continued widespread poverty. And you're going to see the risks that come with that. You're going to see displacement, uh, extremism, desperation. Uh, is, is, is that the future that we want for Afghanistan? Um, and I think the third takeaway uh, would be that there is an alternative. There is an existence of an alternative path. And this is what comes out of so much of the analytical work that the World Bank's done uh, over the past, frankly, 20 years. Uh, this is an economy that, that does have uh, endowments. It's got a young and growing population. It's got an agricultural sector that could expand, that, that is less irrigated now than it was in 1975. Uh, it is an economy where you have huge extractives potential. Uh, so there is this alternative pathway where we move towards mobilizing those endowments towards a sustainable path of private sector-led development uh, that in many ways would get us to a, towards a more uh, solid economic foundation to the one that we have built over the past 20 years. Um, so I think that, that those would be the three takeaways. And in terms of the recommendations, I think the critical recommendation really is on the interim Taliban administration. This, this is the situation at the moment uh, cannot be resolved without international support. And that international support seems very unlikely to be forthcoming unless there is some basic adherence to standards of the treatment of women and girls, uh, democ democratic rights, uh, and, and beyond that, uh, any international support is very unlikely to be effective unless there is some acceptance of these basic fundamentals of economic management, the need to have a stable macroeconomic framework, the need to have uh, some independence in central bank, the need to have capable people in key economic ministries. Without that, it's very hard to see how we, we get out of the current trajectory. The second recommendation, I think, would be more for the international community, uh, and it would be saying that we really don't want to repeat some of the mistakes we've made in the past. What we're looking at now is quite large amounts of international assistance being mobilized for emergency and humanitarian support that is going through off-budget channels. Uh, and we have seen from our past experience in Afghanistan that that brings risks unless we really focus on coordination, alignment, and planning of that support. So what we need to be doing now as an international community is making sure that this inflow of funds is not creating the economic distortions, the challenges to, government, to governance, the corruption, the negative political impacts that large aid inflows in Afghanistan have caused in, in living memory. Uh, and, and that really, I think, requires us to take a very coordinated approach. It requires us to have some kind of framework to guide investment and spending decisions. And it requires us to be engaging with the, international, uh, the interim Taliban administration to understand uh, what the division of labor is in terms of what they will be paying for, what we will be paying for, and what is required to move Afghanistan towards a, a recovery trajectory. And then uh, I think my third and, and, and final takeaway uh, for in terms of recommendations, um, we need to move away from this trajectory. We need to move away uh, from a trajectory of continued dependence upon emergency and humanitarian support. And that means a broader range of international assistance is going to be required. It means we're going to have to find ways of restoring the functionality of the financial sector. It means we're going to have to be providing support to a broader range of public services. Uh, we're going to have to be finding ways to support some of the key enabling environments for private sector investment, uh, infrastructure, 
extra uh, risk management uh, mechanisms for, for private sector firms. But this brings me back to the first recommendation. It's very hard to be able to see us doing that unless there is some concession and compromise by the interim Taliban administration, some adherence to basic international standards that allow us to help. Let me stop there. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Tobias. A lot of food for thought there, which uh, some of those specific areas we'll get into in the uh, in the in the next round of questions. Uh, yeah, it's it's puzzling to me why economic management is such a non-ideological topic, and yet they're messing that up too, because uh, that would be a rather easy thing for them to improve and and get the the World Bank on their side, for example. Um, Nahi, thank you so much for coming. And I'd just like to give you the opportunity to comment on the World Bank's uh, development update, but more broadly, based on your ex extensive experience in the Ministry of Finance, how do you see the fiscal situation and outlook at present? And basically, what needs to be done to get the finance ministry, which was a premier institution when you were there, uh, back on track? Thank you so much, Bill, and very honored and pleased to be here. First of all, let me congratulate World Bank for the re release of both reports, and this is um, evidence of how much World Bank's engagement is vital um, to Afghanistan and the overall um, analysis of the situation. Um, the, as evident from the report, um, the situation seems very daunting, unfortunately, and as predicted um, by many of us before the um, August 15 events. And like Tobias said, um, the unfortunate reality that we have lost the progress of 15 years, but 20 years um, almost. Um, I, we know there are challenges in terms of data gathering and transparency on the ground, and despite that, the um, economic um, outlook report looks um, looks very informative, uh, which gives account of what the situation actually looks like in a comprehensive manner. Uh, but let me also not repeat, but give the backdrop that we are discussing a series of events um, that also affected the situation before August 15, that Afghanistan was already struggling with COVID-19, with political and security uncertainty, um, the drought that uh, in 2020 that all affected the situation. Um, and the imminent fiscal challenges of aid dependency with imminent unpredictable aid um, that also uh, very much influenced the programming capacity of the government and also donors. For the past couple of years, and even before 2020, Afghanistan government at least heard about donor fatigue, and that uh, brought a lot of discouragement to the uh, development programming econo and economic planning. Um, I think we have all, um, if we go to the report, we um, it has very well described the very particular um, events and causes um, of, of the economic collapse, um, the large military contracts that halted, um, money, big investments and in projects that were funded through multilateral agencies were suspended, salary to um, the unfortunate parallel civil servant system that was established in Afghanistan in terms of national technical assistance. They were all halted. Um, but of course, um, we, the, the challenges of transactions and payments that, that crippled trade and import and exports. But let's also keep in mind, and as said earlier, that the economic situation followed the political um, events, and these two cannot be decoupled. So if, if you ask me what are the challenges, fiscal challenges, so the main fiscal challenge is how to offset um, an economy that was funded by uh, uh, approximately $8 billion of dollars investment gap in Afghanistan, either through aid and trade, and if you put it in an overall economic perspective, it is it's such a challenging question. And first of all, um, 
if the issue, the fiscal issues cannot be discussed in a vacuum of political events. And um, it's, it's so difficult to alienate this and there is no technical alternative if you do not discuss the political willingness of the Taliban regime um, for, for governance issues. For example, if you're discussing fiscal gap, you have to um, discuss aid, trade or revenue generation, or both of them. If you, if you want to generate revenues, you have to look at trade, you have to, to look, uh, look at the issues of transactions and payments, and that uh, goes back to the issue of uh, recognition of Taliban and easing of sanctions, and it will go back to the Taliban's willingness to adhere to the human rights, women rights, and some of the standards that Tobias talked about and the overall willingness of Taliban as, um, as how they would want to govern uh, Afghanistan. Um, also, in broader terms of economy, all those endowments that we are talking about, the mining sector or the agriculture sector, the broader question is under what legal framework are these sectors uh, operating? Mining sector itself is a very complex issue and uh, the already legal, the um, complex legal environment before 2020 events and 2021 events um, um, under a constitutional framework and what will be uh, Taliban's reaction to that. But despite these challenges, I think there are few um, quick indicators, I would say, for Taliban to demonstrate their uh, willingness for governance, which has to be closely monitored by international community. But um, I will also keep in mind that whenever we are talking about these uh, alternatives, there's also a risk of um, supporting or um, fallen into danger of supporting a government that's not adhering to um, international standards and human rights standards. Um, for example, one of those indicators could be um, a development plan by the Taliban. And right now there seems to be no comprehensive development plan uh, and path for the Taliban at what sectors are their priorities and what are they really thinking in terms of uh, develop, uh, economic development. And um, what are they, where are the financial resources coming and um, how are they managing the parallel um, funding? Second, we have all noticed that the Taliban regime had an interim budget of three years, uh, of three months. Um, it will be very interesting that they exhibit transparency for the next budget, and but also the expenditures of the three uh, months budget that they had um, they had released. I see no fiscal, at least till, till till date, no fiscal and financial report of the three months budget, and also on the revenues that how they were um, 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 uh, how they were generated and where they have been spent um, also an indicator of how much civil, uh, how many civil servants are being paid their salaries salaries of the teachers um, the, the regime's plan on what would be the uh, um, um, uh, the resources and how how this will be tackled um, the other indicator is also uh, using of existing resources and the transparency. I think there have been many systems um, that were invested on in the past couple of years. Uh, ta Taliban regime have to show willingness to use these systems and be transparent in terms of reporting. Most importantly, I think we've, uh, Tobias has already mentioned it, is maintaining of a network of professionals in the Ministry of Finance that are apolitical and free of any political interference, which seems um, very, very difficult, but this is a show of intent from their part. What I very also concerned is in the lack of, um, in the absence of freedom of speech in media and civil society in Afghanistan, what will be a, source of uh, information on all these measures and how all these measures will be monitored and reported back um, and will not be influenced. I'll stop here and um, we can we can come up to the other topics later. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nahid. Lots of uh, very important points and uh, I certainly agree with you that whereas the Taliban have been doing something on revenue, 
we seem not to have much idea of what how they're spending that money, and that is obviously a concern. And just to, to give one example of my own, uh, the uh, their budget, their three-month budget did provide for payment of teacher salaries, and it's really important to know what is happening there because until the recent education announcement, the, the donors were, and maybe still are, willing to pay teachers salaries if, if girls go back to school. But then what that would do would be freeing up Taliban resources for jails or security or who knows, any other event. So, so this kind of, both from the Taliban side, we need a, a clear budget and from the international community, uh, you know, how that fits in, given the fungibility of resources. I've already exceeded my red as monitor, so I'm, as moderator, so let me move on, but we will come back to some of these points. So, Andrea, the private sector is rightly seen as the ec engine of economic growth in any country, and the bank's report really systematically delves into the perception, views, and self-reported actions of an important sample of Afghan businesses. So what are the four to five key takeaways from this report that you would like to emphasize in terms of the current situation of the private sector and the problems it faces? And then what, maybe going a little bit beyond the report, what would be your three to four key recommendations on that would need to be taken forward on the private sector? So thank you very much, Bill, and colleagues for inviting us. It's actually very good to be, to be here. And giving voice to the private sector, because really this report uh, is really coming out of a survey of uh, about 100 uh, businesses in uh, that we conducted in October, November, really to get the sense of what is really the impact of the situation on, the, on the, those businesses. So let me start by giving you a sense of what, you know, what are the constraints that we hear coming out of the private sector. And the first uh, constraint, I mean, many of you already mentioned it, is coming out of the, out of the financial sector. You know, the top concern for businesses are issues related to the banking sector, the so-called liquidity issue in the, in the country created by the dysfunctionality of, of the payment system, together with the complexity of getting access to foreign currency. And you can imagine in a country which is heavily uh, import dependent, this is a really very big concern. And in general, money is the fuel uh, like on, on the economic engine, and when you have bank closures, difficulties to uh, withdraw deposits, uh, the impossibility of using bank for international payments, all of these are really key drag uh, on the private sector. And you know, I just wanted to recall that the survey was conducted in October, November, so the situation somehow might have changed in some respects by now. However, from the discussion that we have regularly with the private sector, there is one key constraint that remains. So the international payments through banks, they remain very complicated, if not uh, completely impossible. And this is both difficult, both incoming payments and outgoing payments. Uh, and this has an impact on the, on, on the business sector because uh, many businesses rely on informal banking, but also on the banking sector uh, themselves, because uh, uh, you know we know that uh, uh, there are certain type of businesses who can uh, go and uh, conduct transactions either in cash or through the informal banking. But uh, there are certain set of businesses who really need to interact uh, with business partners, who, so they need to go through banks. So what we have seen so, so far, I would call it almost a financial disintermediation. So the financial sector being heavily disintermediated in favor of the uh, former financial system. Now, then the second constraint that we see from businesses, uh, but that uh, perspires when we ask them what is the constraint, but also in other aspects of, uh, of the report, which is uncertainty. Clearly, when we collected the data in October and November, it was very unclear how the political and economic situation would unfold. What kind of policy the new administration would put in place and would have, especially toward the private sector, toward women, uh, and also what could be the impact on sanctions, for example. And all of these has a very, very big impact on business confidence, and business confidence has an impact on how businesses invest. invest. You know, we have seen certain things, for example, on sanctions, there has been more clarity. You know, we have seen the general license being issued, and this has at least uh, 
taken away some of the concerns. However, in, the, in a very like uncertain economic context and the political context, you see that uncertainty has a, a big impact on the uh, investment uh, prospectus. And you see at the, at the end of the report, we ask businesses exactly to tell us what is their outlook. And so there is a big chunk of business that is simply we don't know. And, you know, this is really like, you know, in the, in the do not know uh, phase, they basically adopt to also what uh, could be a wait and see uh, approach. And then we see the third constraint that I will not spend too much time on because, uh, you know, the, we have seen, you know, Tobias and, uh, has already cl uh, put it very clearly, you know, when you have uh, an economy that is heavily contracting, you clearly have a, a dramatic loss in consumer demand. You know, you have less, cons uh, you know, spending by people. Uh, you have people who don't have access to their, uh, to their uh, bank deposit. Of course, you know, this consumer demand has an impact uh, on the private sector. And then finally, you have the restriction on business, for, especially for women. Women both as business owner and uh, uh, women uh, as, uh, as workers. And uh, this is also very much connected to the, to, to the second constraint that I was mentioning, uncertainty. Uh, you know, and the situation remains very, very volatile. Because if you had asked me a few weeks ago, I would have replied that we are really getting into the right path, you know, because we are seeing that especially also on businesses, they were saying, well, when we talk to, biz uh, to, to banks, for example, they tell us, well, I mean, we still have also women uh, working. I mean, we, there are certain restrictions, but um, the situation is getting better. But, you know, then the recent decision on, uh, on uh, girls' education really puts, uh, like, a big question mark also. So as you can see, we have a, a mix of problems that are faced by business, and some of which are under the control of the interim administration. Some other, in order to be resolved, they require also some resumption of uh, development work to spur economic demand. And some other aspects are a little bit exogenous, and it will take time to, to resolve them. So let me start with, uh, with a little bit giving you a sense of for each of them. So let me start with the first bucket, what the interim administration could do. Well, I would say I would focus on two actions. The first one is really how to reduce uh, business uncertainty to, in order to stabilize the business environment and especially keep doing more of what they are doing in a way relatively well. Because if you look at our report, we try to be really balanced in presenting what the businesses tell us. And there are two things that they are the, the, the interim administration is doing well. One is ensuring uh, stability and security and businesses especially men-owned businesses, unfortunately only, but uh, especially on the uh, men-owned businesses, they say, well, finally we see like security, that is very positive. And the second thing, curbing corruption. You know, we, we, you know, we survey businesses dealing with, uh, with customs, and they basically, you see that uh, corruption at customs have dramatically reduced, almost uh, uh, went down to zero. So keep doing that one, this is very important. Uh, and the second I mean, the government can also do stuff in order to stimulate demand. I mean, uh, you know, Bill and Tobias were mentioning, I mean, uh, uh, and also Naid uh, were saying, well, we, you know, paying regularly the teacher, paying regularly the civil servants, this is really might, have a, a, might go a long way, especially in uh, uh, reducing the uh, economic crisis in the city, so that are heavily, very heavily uh, affected by the civil servants not being paid. Of course, you know, restarting also some projects, I mean, that is going to be very, very important. What can then, in this sense, the international community do? I mean, as you, again, we have seen it in the economic development update, you know, development aid was playing a, a critical role in the economy. Uh, and even if not at the same scale, there is a, a need to reignite the economy also by resuming some of these projects. And the, trans the, the private sector is then the transmission channel for this project uh, to have an impact uh, on, on the economy. And then there are actions that I would say that are relevant in order to, to build confidence. And I wanted to stress uh, on a couple of uh, elements. You know, you, uh, in order to resolve this, uh, this crisis, it will, it will have to be taken, it will take time. And we let it take also consistent policies. For example, when we you know, deal with the financial sector, one of the elements that I believe is not uh, stressed enough is that 
one of the reasons why we, we are seeing what we are seeing in the financial sector is because you have a tremendous loss of confidence from the public. You know, we have basically people that are holding cash at home, so banks cannot play a financial intermediation role if people don't, don't trust the banks and don't bring back the money to the bank. So ensuring that there are consistent policies to build back the confidence of the sector. Likewise, okay, still on the financial sector, you see that you, we really need to rebuild the confidence from the international partners, for the, pro, for the banks who are providing correspondent banking uh, relationship with the commercial banks. So consistent policies also on the uh, domestic side are also very important to reflect uh, on that. So those are really my three methods away. Thank you much, Andrea. Again, a lot of food for thought, both in the report and your comments. I'll, I'll resist uh, adding some flourishes and maybe hold them back for later, because I think uh, there are no shortage of flourishes that will be coming from Jeff Grieco. <laughs> so well, my question to you, Jeff, is uh, you have your uh, hand on the pulse of, Af of what prominent Afghan businesses and business leaders uh, are thinking and doing. And many of these uh, prominent businesses and their leaders are actually basically at least regional level multinational corporations right. in both their activities and their investments. So looking at this group, which is very important, I would argue, both for building confidence, as, as Andreas was saying, and, and uh, also for the actual investments and business activities uh, that they do. Uh, what do they see as the couple, of, three or four uh, main problems facing them at uh, present? And what would it take for such businesses, which are actually, you know, rather competitive businesses and, in my view, would come back before the, the purely foreign businesses come back to Afghanistan. What, what would it take for them to increase their investment in Afghanistan? Okay, thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Thanks to USIP, to Scott and Bill for hosting today's meeting, and I want to thank the World Bank team uh, for the, both the rapid survey and the Afghanistan development update. Uh, our members represent Afghan business leaders, Afghan American businessmen and women, Canadian, UK, uh, UAE, Turkey, we have members from all of the Afghan diaspora and business leaders, and we have some of them here in the audience today as well. So we have a pretty broad sampling of people uh, that have very strong feelings on what the private sector should be doing right now and what's, what's happening to it. Um, I'm just back from meetings that we had in Turkey where uh, the estimates of the businessmen that are now moved to Turkey full time is that they now have between Five and eight billion dollars of money moved out of Afghanistan now invested in Turkey, in banks, and they're starting their own operating trading businesses out of Turkey. Turkey's a very export incentive driven country. If you're an Afghan trader and you do a million dollars in export revenue in Turkey, you get a blue passport from Turkey, which is the highest rank passport in the country, and you're treated very differently. Afghans are very focused already. They're the most resilient, I think, business people in the world because they've been through every possible nightmare to survive as private sector partners. Um, the survey from all of our members' perspectives is very accurate. Uh, the survey's results, even though it was uh, two months ago or three months ago now, maybe even longer now, um, but the, the results of it are, are still ongoing, and uh, I'm not going to go into that in great detail. But let me just summarize where our community, our business community on Afghanistan feels they're at. Uh, frankly, they're on the verge of collapse. Um, some of it is our fault in the donor community and in the West. Some of it is the Taliban's fault uh, going forward, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a second. Um, but we have to also be worried now in the, the massive uh, UN-led response to Afghanistan's humanitarian crisis, we in, a, in effect now are basically squeezing out the private sector because only the UN agencies are implementing with NGO partners at the local level. 
school. And there is no private sector participation, even though we've been calling for it, so that we don't let supply chain systems, transportation systems, pharmaceutical and vaccine delivery systems, things that the private sector can do, wither and go away, because the UN is creating a second economy in the country. We're very worried about that, and our businessmen are very worried about it. Deborah Lyons, the head of UNAMA, said in her speech to the Security Council on the renewal of UNAMA's mandate, uh, if you read her speech very carefully, she said to the Security Council, in spite of this unbelievable humanitarian crisis they're going through, that is not the priority. The priority is to get the private economy moving, because if that dies, there's nothing that we'll be able to do to stop the country from falling further, even with a massive humanitarian effort to feed and, and uh, vaccinate people and so forth. We want the private sector supply chain, she said. We want exports and imports to be functioning. It's a trading economy, and they're not able to do trade finance. So from our perspective, as business people, the number one challenge we face now is the stabilization of the commercial banking system in Afghanistan. So uh, we've put out a, a memorandum. To, uh, we've done three memorandums since the Talibs took over on the banking issue, and we keep updating it. Uh, all the Afghan banks are members of our organization, and they're very active in our banking and finance working group. They have very strong feelings on what needs to be done. First the solution, they feel, is to inject liquidity into the banking system immediately by unfreezing or returning approximately $2 billion in depositor funds from the banks that were held by beneficiary account holders by those banks and are now frozen approximately 900 million in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and another 900 million in Europe, uh, frozen right now, both under US and UN sanctions. That is separate from the foreign exchange reserves. So when we hear the 9.7 billion number, that's incorporating both the freeze of the bank assets, but also the freeze of the foreign exchange reserves of DABS, the central bank of Afghanistan. The Afghan businessmen want that liquidity released, but they're not stupid. They don't want it released in bulk. And I think in my talks with our government, the United States government on this, they agree. It should be done incrementally, perhaps month by month, returning bank by bank, depositor by depositor, their funds, so they have access to it. We as donors for 20 years trained an economy to put money not under their mattress, but into a bank for safekeeping, and that it would always be protected in the bank. And now we come, after the government is overthrown, and tell them that they can't have that money anymore. You can understand how irate you might be as a businessman in a trading economy where you have to have trade finance, or you can't export or import anything. And they're worried about their families dying, not having access to food. They can't go and import food uh, to the country because of these frozen assets. Solution two, <clears throat> we have to improve the access to liquidity for the banks and for the Afghan businessmen by launching the new, which we're very honored that the World Bank has, has helped lead this, the new Humanitarian Exchange Facility, HEF. This will be managed, we think, or co-managed by the World Bank and, and maybe UN in some role um, going forward. We don't want this to be a permanent facility. We think it's absolutely necessary to get some way to get cash into the country through some mechanism, get Afghanis circulating in the economy to stabilize the currency, and get dollars uh, delivered from the donors when they need to inside the country uh, for programming. The HEF, I think, will play a very important role. We'd like to have a sunset provision of 12 months on it, because we don't want the HEF to replace the banking system that we're trying to save right now as well. Solution three, we want to fix the cash transfer problems by reappointing a corresponding bank, or what we call an intermediary bank for Afghanistan. Citibank resigned in January for a lot of reasons, but I think the main reason is that they determined, or their board determined, that the risk exposure, the algorithms that they used to determine risk, became too great. And for the small amount of money, they make about 1% or less on each transaction for the country. 
that amount of money very quickly goes away with the risk analysis that worsens after a Taliban takeover. Um, and I think also the fact that our Treasury Department and OFAC issued so many licenses, it scared the bank, and it made them feel are we going to be in a way, in a way to, to be able to judge whether or not any transaction that we're approving for trade, export, import, or even for an investment related uh, transaction, that we're sure that it's going to fit within these licenses? It became too overbearing, I think, for them as well. Um, we'd like to have either uh, a European bank like Commerce Bank of Germany or Crown Agents Bank of the UK is currently doing transactions with AIB, but in a very limited way. Uh, we'd like to see this functionality restored. And there are things, and in our memorandum to the donors and to the US government, we identify ways that the US government could be doing a lot more to bring a bank back into this role through indemnification and other activities. Uh, solution four. We'd like to increase the functionality of the Islamic bank, uh, banking system. We'd like to have a major state uh, partner with UAE Islamic Bank or perhaps the Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation, which the Biden administration is actively right now engaged with on helping on Afghanistan. We'd like to have the Islamic banking component given more credibility and given some role in the future because we don't just want to have one vehicle by which to move money in and out of the country. There should be other license vehicles that will still be within the SWIFT uh, uh, compliance regime. Uh, and we're, we're very careful to talk about this because the businessmen say they're being approached regularly now by Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises who are asking them, we can take you out of the whole SWIFT system and give you loans and grants uh, for financing if you want it. We're happy to help you to do that. So there is already an enemy of, of what I think is where we want the Afghans to go on, on international finance. They want to take them out of the system entirely. Last solution and last comment is we'd like to see more cooperation between the U.S. Treasury Department and the Afghan Central Bank, DABs, both on the capacity side, capacity development issues, and improved functionality. I think before the Doha Forum uh, last month, <clears throat> There was a plan, I believe, by our government, the United States government, to try to figure out a good way to do that and to come forward and make that happen. And the Taliban blew it up by this absolutely ridiculous decision on reversing a, a girl's right to go to get an education. We'll talk more about that, I'm sure, later. But we'd like to see Treasury and the Afghan Dabs have a closer and closer relationship. That can only build more trust into a corresponding bank that would then step back into the role as an intermediary bank for Afghanistan, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Jeff. Lots of, uh, thing, lots of things there. I would just highlight one thing that is also close to my heart. When you have this huge humanitarian aid program, it really should not be in kind. There should be cash or the, even digital payments to beneficiaries and let the Afghan private sector and commercial sector then import the goods, the food, uh, medicines, whatever else is needed. Don't have a UN parallel economy of the UN itself doing that and providing aid in kind. I think this is this is almost should be seen as a no-brainer, and I'm quite aware in the humanitarian community there's been decades of research and and policy uh, conclusions that in that cash aid is usually superior to in-kind aid, and certainly it is in this case because you have a, a commercial sector. Uh, let me turn now for I guess quick follow-up questions to each of the panelists, uh, and. Keeping in the aid coordination uh, uh, sphere, which I think is really important, uh, Tobias, trust funds to mobilize and deliver aid have really proliferated since the Taliban takeover, at least doubled in number, perhaps. I think they're now at least half a dozen, if not more. Whereas certainly when I was in the bank, and I think while you were there as well, we kept arguing, you know, maybe at most two, one civilian, one security. Uh, that's clearly gone by the, the wayside. So. This, this uh, proliferation of trust funds raises questions about aid coordination and aid effectiveness, including not least the cost. What needs to be done to manage such risks? And, and especially, I think, one of the ele two elephants in the room, one is Ukraine, and the other one is this aid is, even this level of humanitarian aid is not going to be 
maintained, and, and we can get into that further perhaps with Nahib. But so with aid on a declining trend and this proliferation of trust funds, how on earth do you try to improve uh, aid effectiveness and coordination? Thanks, uh, Bill. Uh, great question. And I, I think you know it, it's worth thinking about this question again in, in some broader context and some historical context, um, where I think some of the early experience with aid support to Afghanistan, provincial reconstruction teams, large off-budget flows, uh, I think there were some really important lessons learned there about how uh, having aid flow through multiple off-budget mechanisms can create real deep political and governance and conflict problems over time. It can lead to aid being captured. It can lead to elites being empowered in ways that really lead to, to long-term problems uh, of, of state building or, 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 or state functionality. Um, and. And, and then I think more recently, what we what we learned in Afghanistan was that if that if aid flows can be coordinated, if they can be put through some kind of coherent mechanism that, as, as Nahid was saying, is aligned with a national development plan, uh, that can actually achieve amazing results. And this is what we saw in Afghanistan. And I, I think among all of the uh, concerns and all of the uh, reflections about lessons learned, um, what, would, what we need to recall is that uh, uh, Afghanistan actually achieved amazing development gains uh, over 20 years. Afghanistan basically moved from being a, a outlier in terms of the the, uh, the very low quality of development indicators to being around the average for a country at its level of income. So, so we really achieved a lot, and that was by having coordinated national programs delivered on budget and aligned with a national development strategy. You had a national primary health care program, you had a national primary education program, you had a national community development program with reach across the entire country, and they really delivered very measurable results and gains. So how do we get get from this kind of fragmentation back to a state where we are providing aligned and coordinated support, especially when we may not be able to move through government. And I think that's going to take uh, some time. It's a, it's a challenging question. But I think where we need to start that process is by having a very clear assessment of what the economic stabilization and recovery needs are, having that recorded, having that written down in a way that brings in the buy-in of the international community, uh, having a, 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 a program or a document or a plan which basically says, look, here is where recovery is going to come from, here is what that's going to require in terms of public investment and capacity building and institutional support, uh, going through a process that brings the international community in behind that plan. Uh, and finally, that involves uh, dialogue with the interim administration to make sure there's a clear division of labor in terms of who is paying for what, who is doing what, when it comes to the implementation of that plan. So, so I think starting with a clear plan that people can align themselves around, different financing streams can align themselves around, is, is absolutely critical. And then hopefully, as we move over time, we will find opportunities to, to, to uh, harmonize, find synergies, and perhaps uh, consolidate some of the existing financing mechanisms. I don't think we have to go to the point immediately where we say there should only be one or two financing mechanisms. What we need to do right now is align the spending around a plan and then let the comparative advantage of the various involved parties reveal itself in implementing that plan. Thank you, Tobias. Good points. I, I just can't resist adding. I think certainly in the early years, we really actually did put our foot down and tried to avoid a proliferation of trust funds. And we failed with the Asia Infrastructure Trust Fund, but uh, otherwise pretty successful. And a couple like the Counter Narcotics Trust Fund fell apart very easily. Uh, and then there was the uh, NATO ANA Trust Fund, which didn't get very far, but actually used a lot of ADB. Uh, projects as well. So sometimes, yes, I agree. But I, I think, you know, the best a lot way of aligning things is by money, right? I mean, that that's the most uh, strongest way to coordinate aid. But I will stop there and 
keep trying to resist my tendency to come in and thank you for your your thoughts. But and uh, also, I think we'll stay in the aid coordination sphere with uh, Nahid. And uh, as you know, the uh, recent donor meeting mobilized uh, 2.44 billion of humanitarian aid pledges for 2022. I, I think uh, against the request of 4.4 billion, which sounds low, but by by experience with UN appeals, that's not actually bad. They're often quite happy if they get 60 percent. And plus, then particularly because the Ukraine war. Uh, intervened since the 4.4 billion request, I thought, relatively speaking, and relative to other countries like uh, like uh, uh, Yemen, which I think got only about a third of what was requested, uh, Afghanistan did well. So, in addition to any thoughts you have on aid coordination, but should the priority be now now on trying to get more humanitarian aid or on the basic development assistance, sort of the, what the plus side of what people call humanitarian plus thank you thank you bill um, i think the first question on that 2.4 is we we have that that fund available there should be transparency and accountability of where it has been spent and how and sometimes in the uh, haste of uh, delivery and results, we, we tend to um, wait for accountability, which has repercussions, and we have to be cognizant of that. Um, second, um, we, we have all, from, from the World Bank report, um, we, we understand, and also other reports, that humanitarian is not enough if we have to think of recovery and also basic human um, needs. It has to move beyond be, um, the humanitarian aid to basic services, um, for example, education, healthcare, um, basic agriculture, and um, livelihoods. Um, First of all, as, as we have discussed, there are many risks with only attachment to the humanitarian. Um, one of the market failure that we have been discussing, disrupting private sector. Um, there has to be a plan as how this um, tendency towards market failure could be um, tackled. Second, um, with the humanitarian, of course, there are standards, but as we, we know, there have been some propositions for humanitarian plus under the garb of humanitarian which is also falls into the risk of not adhering to the standards of the basic services. And once you uh, extend it to the actual basic services, then you have the opportunity to look into the actual standards of how to deliver <coughs> basic services. Um, some of the issues um, around the basic needs also, which, which not many people are um, pinpointing, and I want to uh, make uh, use of this opportunity on the um, situation of children and women. Um, humanitarian assistance and also given the current um, um, uh, limitations of mobility for women, there's a huge risk of malnutrition and um, going back to the um, uh, uh, deteriorating indica health indicators for women and children that needs to be tackled with the uh, basic services and needs. But given that, there are many challenges that comes with uh, going towards that direction. First of all, as Tobias, um, I, I completely agree with him, but also given the overall absence of an absolute aid architecture for Afghanistan going forward. Um, Earlier, we were arguing for more on-budget spending, and now we are in the situation where how efficiently this aid can be delivered, given that it's less than we had a few years ago. Um, we had different mechanisms of coordination. Now there seems to be um, uh, not, not a specific one with, uh, um, that also represents the needs of the people and a legitimate government that gives the direction and guidance on, on the coordination mechanisms. Second, the risk of parallel programs. Uh, we have seen this in the past couple of months with the same objectives being proposed by different agencies um, that, that needs to be coordinated. Um, I'm not saying that one of them should do 
uh, one, uh, only one agency should deliver, but the important issue is um, um, uh, that, that in terms of geographic coverage, in terms of sectors, and in terms of um, the outreach, it has to be coordinated, um, and also the financial resources should be allocated in a coordinated manner. And very importantly is the use of approaches, systems, and human capital network that has been established. Um, let's also keep in mind um, uh, that we have a history of uh, good national programs that have been designed based on robust assessments. We shouldn't uh, reinvent the wheels, and the um, attempt should be to use them as much as possible. Last but not least, on the basic needs on the overall aid architecture, um, let's, let's pay heed to the conditionalities as well. I think it's important for all donor and international partners to, to an, have an understanding of common conditionalities, not to overburden institutions with too many conditionalities like in the past, but be result-oriented, uh, be very specific and firm on, on some of the red lines, but also um, in terms of sectors that what can be really achieved and beneficial and efficient going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to illustrate some of these points about coordination, I would just highlight, I think in the early years we did a, a study on public expenditure on basic health, and before the national program was consolidated, the cost per capita among, among different donors and different delivery partners differed by a, a range of 20 to 1. And similarly, I think more recent work on the cost of school construction shows probably, Nahid might know better, but something on the order of a 10 times difference in the unit cost of, of school construction versus, uh, you know, by different donors and under different arrangements. And in, as far as I know, in all the cases, the, U, the, the unit cost was lowest in the national programs. Um, I, I don't know if we have any questions at all from the audience, but. Uh, Let's go through the last two. There are some. OK, good. I'll start reviewing them. But uh, Andrea, realizing we're short of time, and Jeff, you're going to make up for your overage on the first comment okay. with your second one. But Andrea, maybe could, uh, for people who don't really know exactly, uh, briefly, I know it's a technical and complicated thing, but, but since the humanitarian exchange facility came up, maybe you could just briefly, for a layman, outline what's happening and, and what would be the benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, and thank Jeff for for mentioning it uh, also. I mean, what is the, the humanitarian exchange facility? It's, it's basically is a temporary uh, instrument that has uh, basically that wants to address two uh, two problems. One uh, is the the fact that the, the central bank is unable to uh, access international payments, and at the same time. In parallel, also, you have that uh, what we would call a de-risking from international financial institution that basically created a blockade or a semi-freeze of the corresponding banking relationship. So what, what does the humanitarian facility uh, want to do is basically want to achieve three objectives. One, to facilitate the delivery of aid, so these funds that are you know, they are outside, so if you have dollars that want, the, and if you are a humanitarian agency or an uh, international NGO that has dollars outside, normally you are wiring money in, and the money was disbursed by a bank. Right now, this simple process is not possible anymore because you uh, end up with uh, two constraints. One is the fact that you might have an international bank that doesn't process this wire transfer. And secondly, even if you are lucky enough that the wire transfer goes through, you end up in a bank in Afghanistan with a nice account with $5 million, but you cannot withdraw the money. And, uh, but at the same time, you have another problem, which is just like the, the mirror problem of the, of the former, which is uh, if I'm an importer, I have sold my products. I'm a businessman who has sold the products in Afghanistan. I collected the Afghani. Normally, I was going to my bank, depositing the Afghani, ask them to convert into dollars and pay for my suppliers. This thing is not possible for the same reason that I described before. What do you want to do with the humanitarian facility? Some kind of offsetting mechanism in which these two flows can be offset against one another. What is the objective, an, an addition, an ulterior objective that you want to achieve with that one? You want also to create confidence in the in the banking sector, because you know the fact that the, the banks get money reflows, you know, and the fact that they 
the corresponding then see some flows like uh, going through it might also unlock the, uh, the situation in the uh, in the medium term in the domestic and international now yeah this is basically what it is i think it is a, it's a work that has been done uh, in a very strict collaboration between uh, the uh, un uh, and the world bank and a number of other uh, Agencies, including uh, the U.S. government, has been uh, uh, and we are ready to put it in, like at least to, to pilot. So what we are really waiting is the uh, some kind of uh, green lighting from the from the central bank, and basically one of the green uh, one of the uh, elements that the central bank has to agree is that the money that is brought in into the into the system through the humanitarian facility has to be somehow earmarked for the for those purposes so it's not a general deposit that is deposited in a bank but it's a deposit that can only be used for those specific purposes no well, thank you andrea and i think uh, the the bottleneck actually that i've also heard is is now that the taliban don't understand, and I also heard that the this this illustrates the need for engagement by international financial institutions, etc. That basically the UN did not really have the expertise to actually explain the uh, the system in ways that the technocrats remaining at the Ministry of Finance felt comfortable with. So, as good technocrats, they're asking a lot of questions. And I think that, you know, again, whether the UN is, is equipped to go into the financial details of this, I don't know. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to hold you to a very short. I'm just going to ask you one question related. I mean, can the Afghan business sector play a positive role in, di uh, in dialoguing with the Taliban administration and possibly serve as a bridge between the Taliban and the international community? Absolutely. I think we've already started doing that uh, already. Um, I just held a, a, a Zoom meeting yesterday with all the board of the Afghan Chamber of Commerce and Investment. They are having regular meetings with the Talibs. They had an EU delegation in yesterday. They have a UN delegation coming to meet them day after tomorrow on the banking issues. Um, so they are already serving as kind of a voice of the sector into the Talibs and and into the interim administration. Um, we have major proposals that our business community has developed with the donor community that could be resuscitated quickly in agriculture, in regional ag exports, in water supply, in bottling, in apparel manufacturing, in mining, in energy development. All of these are labor intensive jobs. We could put thousands of Afghans to work very quickly. Some of these were operational before the fall and everything stopped when they took over. Some of them were in the works to be uh, to be launched uh, right around now. And uh, we think those could be brought in as well. So there are a lot of things that the private sector can do. And the Taliban are telling the United States in Doha in their private meetings that they want investment from the West and from the United States. They want trade. They want to do things to get the economy moving. Let's call them at their word and try to do it. Thank you, Jeff. I'm going to follow up with now with questions from the audience, which are most welcome. And uh, I'll, uh, there are some very rich questions, some of which, like with the opium ban, getting into huge areas, which would we could have another two-hour meeting on. So, but Jeff, let me just follow up on that. Uh, as people have been highlighting, the Taliban appear to be doing better in terms of corruption. And what evidence do you have for that assertion? And how do you uh, assess the strength and reliability of that assessment? I think I need your mic because I think yeah, mine's not working. Um, yeah, so uh, our business leaders are telling us that approximately 21 to 22 percent of their shipments going from, say, Kabul to Karachi for exports are now going with no corruption. So 20 to 20 to 22 percent is being returned to them as as profit on these shipments that they didn't realize before. In addition, 
the shipment time to go from Kabul to Karachi now has been cut in, I, I would say, it's been improved by over 300%. So they're able to move a container from Kabul to Karachi in days, as opposed to having both the Afghan border police uh, seek bribes, as well as the Pakistan border police. Even Pakistan now, with the Taliban control, has stopped most of the corruption. It's not completely gone. There is some at Karachi port to move your stuff more quickly if it's vegetables and, and perishables. But um, I think that tells us that the Taliban have shown that they can do things to help the private sector economy. They're listening to the business leaders who don't want to pay corruption, but in previous governments, it was basically writ of the palace and their leadership. They're not doing that anymore to a large extent that we know. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, I think you'd like to follow up on that, Andrea, Andrea but I also want to add one question to, in addition to that, if you want to respond briefly first to that. But the, the other one is, let's say that some of Jeff's recommendations are implemented of returning some of the reserves. What, what would, uh, wouldn't that just translate into more capital flight? I mean, we had about five billion a year, according to some estimates of capital flight from Afghanistan be, you know, before August. And uh, so, so how would you avoid sort of incre improving the liquidity of the banking system, but just uh, basically uh, all of it going into capital flight and not supporting domestic uh, development or domestic private sector development? So giving you two. So I start with the easy one. Yeah, exactly. This is basically, no, following up, uh, I mean, on what Jeff was mentioning, I mean, we're asking for evidence. I mean, I really, from our survey, you really get exactly that evidence. And you really see the data that we get on the on the import-export operation are absolutely striking. And I mean, and, and as Jeff said, you have an issue of a uh, payment. But for businesses, I really, I don't know if it's as much as the payment of the time that you save and right. the fact that you have the certainty. As Jeff was saying, if you have a, a container with uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, perishable stuff, uh, that's really like, uh, you know, the fact that you have the certainty that you go to the border and it passes in two days rather than having sitting like for weeks, uh, that is really very important. Now, uh, discussion on frozen assets. That's, uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very complicated uh, issue in the sense that you have both uh, I would say two, a couple of things here. One is that you have an issue of mechanics. That is all, it's not just important uh, what, but also, as Jeff mentioned it, how to. Because what you have right now, you have, the fact that you have a central bank that uh, is missing the link with the international financial system. So it's not just, a, even if somebody were to say, well, I want to release a certain amount, how do you release it? Probably, I wouldn't exaggerate to say that probably the only way to do it right now would be probably by shipping cash into Kabul. Is it really something that we want? I mean, I think you gave already uh, the right, uh, you know, the answer. I mean, I really think that that aspect is, is very important. The second element is, uh, uh, and it pertains to the, to the domestic system, which is if you have a system where depositors don't have uh, confidence, you know, giving liquidity to the bank, but you know, would only result in really the depositor trying to extract as much uh, deposits from the banks and basically shrinking the financial system in the best possible scenario. Could I mean that's uh, the reason why you have a deposit uh, deposit limit is because you have a, you had a run on the banks, and uh, in any circumstance, not just in Afghanistan, when you have a run on the banks, what you do you have a deposit limit. So giving like liquidity to the banks before the confidence is reinstated, I think that could also be very risky for the financial sector as well, for the stability. Thank you. A very good answer and helpful. I'm actually going to ask a, uh, a somewhat technical question that came from the audience for Tobias, and it relates to the earlier comments and also to the fact that uh, there's also a shortage of Afghani banknotes in Afghanistan, which makes really interesting economic dynamics. So the question uh, from the audience is, does the panel have a view on the exchange rate regime? Is the current, quote, stability through rationing approach reasonable or better to allow free, uh, free floating exchange rate? Well, um, I, I think, you know, what I would say is I, you know, I don't think there is an exchange rate regime at the moment. You know, I, I think 
Is this working? Yeah. Um, I don't think there really is an exchange rate regime at the moment. I mean, that's how I would characterize it. What you have is you have a, an intense shortage of US dollar notes in, in, in circulation, uh, and then you have a fixed supply of Afghani banknotes in circulation, uh, and the central bank has no control over the money supply. All right, so it's, it's not really fulfilling the function of a central bank. A, a, and what that means is that there is no adjustment mechanism uh, when it comes to the exchange rate. So while uh, typically when you had a, a massive demand shock combined with a, uh, a, a financial sector crisis and, and a balance of payments problem, you would expect depreciation, very sharp depreciation of your, of your domestic currency. What we've seen in Afghanistan is that that depreciation just hasn't emerged because people still have a demand for holding on to Afghani notes. And there's only so many Afghani notes in circulation for them to hold on to. So for as long as that demand for the Afghani is there, there's a, there's a, there's a, a flaw on, on how much depreciation, depreciation we're going to see. And, and that exchange rate is not being managed through any kind of policy because they're not controlling uh, the supply of, of the domestic currency. Uh, so it's it's this weird uh, um, rigidity and, and and this absence of an adjustment mechanism. And I think what's interesting about that is really what, what that means is that much more of the adjustment is being forced much more quickly onto consumption. Uh, so it's not necessarily a good thing at all, because what we're seeing, what you would typically expect to see is some depreciation of the exchange rate. Um, uh, and that would allow prices to adjust, and it would allow uh, foreign exchange reserves to be potentially released into the economy to smooth that adjustment, and, and you'd have a temporal aspect of that adjustment. Whereas what's happening now is that that adjustment is happening immediately, and you're seeing this strange combination of reduced demand and increased prices because the exchange rate cannot adjust. So, so you know, I, I think the it's very interesting uh, thinking about how this this goes in future. I mean, I, I think the Taliban administration seemed very fixated on the exchange rate as a kind of indicator of their competence in economic management, and I think that's not a good indicator at all. I think what we would want to see is an orderly long-term adjustment, uh, depreciation of the exchange rate over time that would allow Afghanistan to become more competitive uh, and, uh, and address what is a structural trade imbalance. It, it needs to be addressed. Let me stop there, Bill. Oh, thank you. Yeah, very interesting points. I, I would, uh, Andrea reminded me that, of course, there actually are pretty significant cash dollar shipments in, and I've, I've sort of asked uh, people in U.S. Treasury, why don't you mark them and see how many are in Pakistan within a few months? But, but, uh, but the point being that that also then, uh, in this odd way, with the, it's not only the fixed supply, but apparently deterioration in Afghan currency banknotes, which even a couple of years ago, I, I noticed there were some in, Worse shape than others, some hardly usable, and that they can't. The central bank can't redeem those because it doesn't have new, new ones. So, yes, I think we're. It's actually going back to a quantitative adjustment versus a price adjustment. We we haven't really thought this out. So that was an excellent question. Uh, conscious of the time, we we can go to, to 11:30, uh, but let me ask uh, Nahid what was a very good question, and maybe the. The easiest question of them all? We'll see. How can donors avoid helping the illegitimate Taliban regime while supporting the humanitarian and, I would add, basic needs of Afghans? Okay. To be honest, this is um, something as, um, as ex policy maker or middle management or even as a responsible Afghan citizen I've been um, struggling with. When you even talk about recovery of economy and, or helping economy recover or delivery of basic needs, you inadvertently um, support a regime that shows no intent of um, of helping themselves, to be honest, or the people. Um, but at the end, um, the objective is very people-centric um, with, with challenges still. I don't think there, I have solutions for it at the moment, but there could be few um, 
quick, quick attempts. For example, one of them to establish an independent central bank for um, um, for easing the uh, the uh, transaction and payment um, issues. That also is very challenging, given how how independent that can be established. It needs a lot of technical discussion with experts on the central banking. Um, few of the functions that can be um, alienated from the current system and put under um, very firm control. Um, have to make sure that the um, um, AML and safety functions are there and, and some of the monetary policy um, frameworks. On the national programming side, for example, I'm, and I, this, this is really unfortunate that today, after a few years, I'm sitting here and not supporting the on budget and national, national systems. A few years ago, we were insisting on adhering to national systems, but right now, because of the unfortunate situation where we are, um, I, I have to say that some of them can be decoupled from the national systems put outside the systems where there's no control of Taliban interference, but maintaining the basic in infrastructure, for example, the softwares, the human capital, as we've talked about, the, the standards, um, so it can be when, when there's a time, it can be shifted back to a systems without much interruptions. I think these could be some some examples of the attempts um, that one can make um, to to deliver these these needs, but um, avoid any sort of interference. Um, but um, again, this this needs to be done under um, under very tight control and uh, monitoring by everyone. Um, and, and giving the uh, civil society and experts a voice um, for technical discussions. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, realize we're now getting the point with each answer to a question we're generating more questions, which I, I think is a, a, a testimony that uh, it's a lively discussion and the audience is interested. So have, I think I'm going to respond myself quickly to a couple of them. And then I think we do have to close at 11.30, so I'd like to uh, give each panelist a, an opportunity for, for the final, uh, for their, to give the final word. So very quickly on a couple of them, what is the reason behind the Taliban's ban on poppy? We don't know. But uh, what we do know, because the second part of the question is what is the impact on the economy, that this is a crazy policy at the worst possible time. Hundreds of thousands of Afghan farmers and households depend on opium now. I'm, uh, obviously, it's not good for the country to depend on, on this uh, illegal crop in the long run. But in the short run, when the economy has taken already, as, as Tobias and the development update has, has shown, a, a huge hit in, with the reduction of about a third, you're really going to, to put hundreds of thousands of Afghan rural households out of business. It's so one can speculate about the mo motivation, and I, I won't get into that, but it again is a sign of the, I think the Taliban administration's lack of, of savvy on some of these economic policy issues and the macro economy. And I would add to what uh, Nahid said, why, why not have an, uh, a technocratic central bank governor? Why pick a Taliban figure leader who is individually sanctioned for, I believe, for that job? And similarly, I think the Ministry of Finance is also sanctioned. So it would be very easy, not, well, who knows how in their internal deliberations, but these are technocratic areas where there's not that much ideology involved. And it's so, in my opinion, it's disappointing that they don't have technocrats uh, uh, prominently involved in some of these key economic management uh, initiatives. Uh, strengthening agriculture. One long-term issue is, is the scarce resources water. So I would just highlight there. And I think it's actually one of the shortcomings of the international in intervention that in 20 years, there were not really major water conservancy developments. I think as Tobias said, there's less irrigated area, in a effective irrigated area in Afghanistan than in the 1970s. And that, I think, is a, a severe indictment of the international assistance then. Uh, on China and other regional countries, uh, this is interesting. Uh, the experience we've had over the last 20 years is that uh, uh, they they do, you know, there's remarkably little, and I think it's also been remarkable, and I'm sure the Taliban are deeply disappointed not to be recognized even by their strongest supporters, 
like Pakistan, et cetera. But uh, uh, I think one point I would make is on the national programs and basic services and, and standards, it seems like they're, they're really not stepping up or let alone providing funds directly to the Taliban. So there may be mining, energy, and other issues. Uh, Yes, uh, another person raised rightly the banking issue. I think we, we covered it. Uh, and another question on the, uh, I'm throwing these out just in case Jeff or somebody else may want to answer some of them in this final point. So these are very good questions. Uh, what about the telecom sector? How well is it functioning? Uh, can private sector investment be attracted to that? Uh, the UN parallel economy, uh, I would just refer to my earlier answer that you should be, there is a commercial sector, there are issues with the banking system, but they definitely can import. And, you know, there are food supplies in Afghanistan now. The problem is people don't have cash aid to be able to afford the food. And, uh, yeah, yeah, inflation. Uh, so why don't we go through some final Final comments and apologies if we ha haven't done, and, and particularly myself, haven't done justice to some of these questions, but they really are big and, and important questions. We'll go in reverse order uh, with each uh, panelist maybe giving uh, two or three final points, uh, and we really t try to close about 11.30. Okay. Um, so I want to focus on the Taliban, um, which probably will get me in trouble. Um, our business community feels that there's no trust in the Taliban's word anymore. The reversal of the decision on girls attending school is a fundamental commitment that they made publicly, they made it privately, and they now have backed off and reversed it. And the donor community will never, will never relent on girls being able to go to school where they choose and how they choose. So the Taliban need to focus right now on confidence building measures. So I'd like to throw out three confidence building measures that they should do immediately. First, reverse the education decision publicly and explain how this will, how these rights will be enforced Secondly, we want our traders need access to, to trade finance, and we can't do that if the donors all feel that trade finance is going to be stolen by the Taliban or some co political control over the central bank uh, stealing the transfers. So we need to have public assurances and have a decision, whether it's an independent DABS or something in a hybrid form, they need to work that out right now. That has to be something that needs to be done right away. Lastly, we want, to re we want them to reaffirm the amnesty for all the business leaders who left because they've repeatedly, from the top of their leadership down, have said, we have amnesty now. And at the same time they're saying it, there are groups hunting down some of our business people, some of the other former government people still in the country. And uh, where they're taking them, sometimes we never find out. Sometimes they get returned and they're told they can't speak to anybody about what happened to them. We need to know that the amnesty is real, that business people are going to be allowed to return, start their businesses with no interference, and that the economic freedoms, the market-led economic growth that the previous governments had allowed would, would be allowed to be reinstituted so that the private sector can thrive. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Andrea. Thank you. I think, you know, along the line of the confidence building, I would just repeat a couple of things that I uh, already emphasized. Uh, I would, you know, we really hope to come back six months from now with the next uh, round of the survey, because actually that's what we're trying to do, to do it regularly, to be able to have a pulse of the situation and really see that both stability and corruption being like, you know, at the level that we, uh, we saw now. And the other is uh, is on, uh, on institution building. I mean, I really think out of this panel today, we heard several times we, what we need is basically we are clearly like an independent and a capable central bank, but also like a minister of finance. I really think we don't. I haven't heard it enough. Like you know, because the, the role of the ministry of finance, and uh, and I think that's uh, fundamental. Thank you, Andrea. Over to you, Nahid. 
three quick points. Um, not working. So um, there are, in the report, there are some encouraging results on the um, corruption and instability. But let's keep in mind when you're talking about security, um, it's not about military presence or bullets being fired, but we are also talking about human security. There's a risk of exclusion of many people to access of services, um, of firms uh, being treated differently, and there are anecdotal reports which needs to be monitored very diligently. Also on the corruption, um, although encouraging, but uh, this needs diligent reporting and monitoring. There is less aid, less acti economic activities going on, which which might seem that there is less reports on, on corruption, but it doesn't mean that corruption has been curbed out. There are still anecdotal reports of um, illegitimate um, 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 asks, and that, that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, second, um, I think when we are talking about some of the red lines and conditionalities, we shouldn't be um, uh, we shouldn't limit ourselves to minimum of those services. Education is important, but it's also um, consider the quality of these services. For example, education and health that that we have to stick to. We shouldn't reverse these those gains. Um, last point: we have to move quickly on some of the. Um, uh, suggestions that are being made for the past couple of months and, and weeks because people need services and the presence on the ground is very important to also look at the reactions of the regime and how it's going. Uh, but also last, which, which um, would, this would be last, is there needs to be a political roadmap. We cannot again discuss economy without a political settlement and way forward. Uh, even if you want to. Thank you. I would, thank you. I would re reinforce your last point about the linkage between the politics and the economy. And on the corruption, I just to highlight, this may be an evolving situation, right? I mean, post-2001, corruption was relatively modest, and then it burgeoned over time. So as the Taliban get used to being in power, it's quite possible that, that it will get worse. And so better to nip it in the bud now rather than let it get out of hand, as happened post-2001. So final word to you, Tobias. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, look, I mean, I'll, I'll try and be very clear. I mean, I, I think we, I'm not sure how many members of the interim Taliban administration are, are paying too much attention to what we say about the economy. Um, but I think we need to have a, a clear view as the international community. And I think we need to do three things. Firstly, we need to provide basic support and humanitarian support in the most efficient and effective way possible while doing as little harm as possible. Because this is going to be required for a long time, no matter what happens. This is a poor country that just became much poorer. We need to find ways of doing this in a way that, that really makes the biggest impact we can with, with limited resources. The second thing we need to do. The interim Taliban administration are the constraint to a broader economic recovery at the moment, both through their political positions and their economic positions. We need to make that clear to them. We need to have a single line going to them, explaining to them that they are the constraint. And for that constraint to be removed, there is a very clear list of things that we expect. Uh, I think only by providing that level of coherence and clarity will we be able to get movement. And thirdly, I think we need to be prepared to move with a broader program of economic support if that door opens to us. So if the political constraints are removed, we need to be able to know what we need to do and have a plan in place to move quickly to get it done. That involves the financial sector, it involves private sector support, it involves infrastructure and services. But, but, but the time, as Nahid says, time is of the essence. If we actually want to turn this economy around and move back to something like uh, a stable or recovering economy, it needs to be done fast. So we need to be prepared. Let me stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tobias. And I absolutely, the need for preparation is there. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that different agencies are are working on things uh, to, to, to possibly expand uh, if, if this situation warrants it. Look, thank you very much. Uh, we, I think the panel enjoyed the panel. We hope you enjoyed it. And uh, 
it will be available, the recording, and that can be disseminated further. So thanks again for the uh, patient audience in, in the room and also for the uh, virtual audience uh, watching. Uh, we really appreciate your participation. Thank you.